All right, welcome to a February wrap up. We're going to discuss all the things I read this month and kind of check in and see if I've accomplished or kept to my goals of DNFing when I want to, not pushing myself to read, etc. And I think it's a little bit of a mixed bag this month, but it's not bad. It's largely on track. I read nine books, around 4,500 pages. I did DNF one book, which we'll talk about at the top. And although my average rating is 4.11, so seven of the nine things I finished, maybe, actually maybe it's six of the nine things I finished was four star and above. One of the three and a half stars, I don't mind that I finished. It's just that that's where it landed. And then two of the others, the three and a half and three, was like half of the pages I read this month, maybe. <laughs> maybe a little less than half, maybe more like, I don't know, between a third and a half of my pages. And I think there's something to be said for maybe I should be waiting when I'm like trying to look at the average rating of the month. Like, obviously, I don't want to change that this average rating is 4.11 based off number of books, right? But I wonder if averaging it by pages and weighting it that way would be more revealing. Because I remember reading the three star books more than I remember reading the better books, mainly because I spent less time reading the better books because they were so good. I read them in such a short period of time. <laughs> So that was interesting, but only one thing I wanted to DNF this month. I don't have regrets about finishing anything else, but I do kind of wish I didn't push myself to power through some of the things that were fatiguing me, even though they are now off my plate. I don't think that was a great thing to do to myself. So that's kind of my reflection <laughs> on what I have done this month. But also, all things considered, this month was absolute trash when it came to my mental health, and the fact that I've accomplished all of this, cool. Like, it happened. <laughs> And we're just going to get into it, starting with the DNF. And unfortunately, I DNF'd The Empire of Silence, which was our Patreon read-along for the year. Not off to a great start. <laughs> um, we did choose a different series to read. Um, if you if you want to find out, this, I'll talk about it when we get to April and we're going to read it. But we did vote on my Patreon for another series to read together. Especially because, for the large part, I don't think anyone actually had an incredibly successful experience reading Empire of Silence in the Buddy Read. I will keep those chats up if anyone wants to continue reading the series together and anything like that. But in general, most people had an okay time or DNF'd it like I did. And I, for me, it was purely apathy. I was bored. I was just really bored. And I know people say the first book is slow. Pacing is not an issue for me normally. I love slow things. A lot of my favorite books, the biggest critique in other people's reviews are, but the beginning is slow. That doesn't matter to me. If I'm engaged, I'm engaged. And this is a character-driven story. We are learning about Hadrian, how he became the legend that he is, what he did in this grand universe that has probably really cool world building. But as of 160 pages into this first book, I did not care about this dude. He's a privileged boy, very melodramatic in his old age and young age. And it's just hard to get behind it. It's just like, I didn't care. I was just like, dude... I get it. Your life's not perfect. Your dad definitely doesn't love you, but also you're doing fine. And then he does stuff that makes his life infinitely less fine. <laughs> and I just have to watch. And there was just no intrigue for me because the intrigue of the story is you want to know how Hadrian became who he is, right? Because he's so cool. But if you don't think he's cool, there's suddenly no intrigue. And I know things get wacky in later books, but it's a seven book series and I was struggling through the first 150 pages and the books just keep getting longer. So because I was already fatigued from another very long indulgent series that we're about to talk about, I DNF'd it. And I'm very happy that I did that for myself. But I guess we'll get into my first category. I kind of do categories. This first category is definitely a cop out, but there's four categories this month. <laughs> and the first one is Wheel of Time. <laughs> I think this is where I was like, I think the majority of the pages I read were these two books. Um, the Tower of Midnight, right? Is that what it's called? Towers of Midnight and A Memory of Light. I read both of them. I think I spend about half the month reading these two books while reading other things. But, you know, they're very long. Like this is the mass market paperback of one of them. They are long. And the this is the short one of the two I read. They're very big books. Um, they're a lot of audiobook hours, even reading it at three times speed. It takes a very, very long time. And I will say, and I'm going to do a spoiler free should you read next week, the same style I do all my should you read. So it won't be like me. Hard. It's not the why di I didn't like this series video, although you'll probably understand why it doesn't work for me from that video. But it's not like 
going to be that type of video. I haven't filmed it yet, so maybe I'm speaking too soon, but I wrote down my notes and I don't think that's the video it's going to become. And it's just, for me, there wasn't any real significant payoff, but I also don't think I regret reading the entire series. Like, I, it met my expectations. It was just incredibly long. And I, as I said in my Friday reads when I finished Memory of Light, I do think that last book, it's for the really mega fans who have been there from the beginning, who have been on the forums, who have been making all of these connections the entire time. I think it's for them. And I think that's what it should be. I'm not here complaining that as a casual reader of the series, it didn't have met, like huge payoff for me. And maybe I should have DNF'd way earlier. Maybe there's someone who would have DNF'd at book 13. Maybe that's what I should have done. But also, I think that person who would have been able to DNF at book 13 would not have made it to book 13. And I, you know, I did this to myself and I recognize that. Um, I'm really excited, though, to do a spoiler chat with my friends. So it's going to definitely be worth it for that. I've already actually really enjoyed watching a lot of Wheel of Time content to see how vastly different my opinions are from other people. I just find that fascinating. And I might do one spoiler video myself of either doing like a character tier ranking thing or I don't know responding to certain things that I hear all the time with like my receipts of why I think those things are not as accurate for my experience. So in general I don't mind that I suddenly have my own opinions on this like mega huge epic series but I think I do have regrets that I read them both in February and I think I only wanted to do that because Gathering Storm was really strong. I really liked Gathering Storm and so I just assumed these other two would be just as engaging for me and they weren't bad but it was it, they were too long they were too long and somehow did not do enough. I, I don't know how else to explain it but it just definitely proved to me that sometimes you can get too big and you can't it's really difficult to make everything satisfying when you get too big, if that makes sense. But because I was very fatigued by that, I could not with Empire of Silence. I just couldn't. I was like, I, we have we have run out of three-star experience for the month from Angela. Cannot continue. <laughs> so I don't know what rating I gave the last two books. It's definitely three to three and a half stars. It's probably three stars for both of them, if I'm being honest. Especially because, like... It is really hard for me to remember certain things. And also, I the last book is not a bad book, but I was finishing it just to finish it. And that's really not where you should be at the 14th book in a series. And I get it. It's my fault, but still. Um, the next category we're going to get to, I'm just calling kind of dark, <laughs> heavy themes. It's dark. Go in looking at content warnings if that's the type of reader you are sort of thing. Starting with Africa Risen. This was my other lower read of the month, three and a half star, and it was for two months. And obviously it's an anthology. There were some amazing stories in here. Um, there were equally though, a lot of stories that I'll never think about again, which is definitely like more of a three, three and a half star story for me. And I think part of that is because there's a lot of dark, heavy content being explored. This, this short story anthology is curated leaning it that way. Obviously, there's like 40 to 50 stories. Like it's not actually all very dark, but it's a wide percentage. Like if you actually want that, if you want darker stories, darker sci-fi stories that aren't necessarily straight up horror, or you like that horror, sci-fi, horror, fantasy overlap, you should try this out. And equally, there are other stories that are just sci-fi or fantasy or a blend of those things. I had some that I really loved. I had some, like I said, that were really difficult. There was a lot of graphic content in here. So again, just take care of yourself if you go into it. But I'm glad I read it, especially glad I buddy read it. I'm a big proponent of buddy reading these types of anthologies. And I was thinking because, again, we're in this year where I'm trying to DNF more when things don't work for me. And obviously a lot of stories in this collection really didn't work for me. And although in a short story collection, I might be more likely to DNF a story because once I get the sense of an author's style, I can kind of know when they're leaning on the things they do that work or doesn't work for me. In an anthology, I'm just getting like one chance with each author. And I feel like I'm just more likely to just be like, well, this is a chance. We will finish this through unless it was like a novelette or novella length. But none of these were that long. I think the longest story was like 30 pages or something like that. So I'm really glad I read it. I think it's a really ambitious collection. I do think anthologies are stronger when they're around 300 or 350 pages, just because again, you avoid the fatigue. And I also think, like I said, 
this collection is meant to collect a lot of voices from Africa or the African diaspora. But I also think anthologies for me are better when they have like a very concise, controlled theme that all the authors are writing to. And this has some thematic overlap. There were definitely themes that a lot of authors were writing from. You could definitely kind of group it like that. But when it gets this long, for me, it's hard to like keep track of the focus. And it's just a super personal preference. Obviously, a larger collection means more voices get to be shown to the world. And that's probably better. But in terms of like a concise form of art, my favorite anthologies have always been the shorter ones. And I think that's probably why. So that's the first one. The other one I really liked. And that's Lone Woman by Victor Laval. Oh, this was so fun. This was a really successful buddy read. I read this with Mara, Bethany, and Jocelyn. And we all had four to five star experiences with this. Read it in like three to four days. So fun. This is definitely one of those like page-turning horror thriller stories. It takes place in 1915-ish um, on the western part of continental U.S. We have this woman leaving California. Her opening scene is she is burning her family's farm with the bodies of her parents in it, and you're like, what, what happened? And then she travels to, I think it's Montana. I almost wanted to say Minnesota, but I'm fairly certain it's Montana, to be a homesteader to escape that and presumably escape her past, which we're like, what's your past? What's in the box? Like that type of energy. And it's a Victor Laval. I've read two other works by him and he does tend to like hook you with one story and then partway through you're suddenly consuming a different story, but you're not mad about it. It's that type of thing. Like, maybe you would be mad about it. Like, but I really liked what you set up here and now we're focusing on something else. I don't mind. He's definitely a storyteller. I tend to just trust and I generally have a really good time with it. This also, I just love good homesteader survival energy. It's just really interesting to me. And the community you are surrounded with, there's so much rich representation from the 1915s here. Like a lot of people you don't normally get to see in this kind of historical setting. So that's top tier. The story, face value, gripping, page turner. Even if you predict things, it still has great payoff in my opinion. And if you like your horror thrillers to have good thematic content, it's really rich here. If you want to engage with that, you also don't have to. The story is great in its merits as just a story. So yeah, this was really fun. Obviously I can't talk about a lot of the elements because I don't know, discovery is sort of a thing in this type of subgenre of speculative fiction, but it was a great time. That said, if you do not like graphic scenes in your books, I would stay away from it. It is still like exploring those societal issues. It is still quite graphic. I don't think it's scary. Personally, for me, it wasn't like a scary read at any point, but definitely a lot of blood. Just, just keep that in mind. So from there, we're going to go into, what do I have next? Oh, Angels and Demons. I named this category Angels and Demons. <laughs> I didn't read that book this month. I have read it in the past but I did not read that book this month. And we'll start with Chain of Iron because for the first time ever outside of my Goodreads <laughs> sort of secret project video, I can talk about a Cassandra Clare book that I've read in the past couple months because I've been reading her every month since December and I just haven't been able to. And I do think once I finish um, this trilogy and I, I can't decide if I'll do it after I finish this trilogy or if I'll do it after I finally finish The Artificers and then I'll have read all of her novels that are currently out in the Shadowhunter world. I'm not gonna read the short stories no one's going to make me. I'm not doing that. But I might do a whole like discussing Cassandra Clare and me and why I like them or I don't know. They're not like amazing. Nothing has been above a four star. Even this book. Really fun. One of my favorites. Only a four star. But I think they just know the assignment. I don't know. It's just a fun time. Um, I really enjoyed this one. This one was for me probably the strongest in terms of blending the plot and the relationship tensions because I do tend to come to Cassandra Clare for relationship tensions. Like I do. Um, I'm here for the love triangle. I'm here for the messy. Oh, I have feelings for them, but of course they don't have feelings for me. And why are we alone in this room all of a sudden? Like, I, I love those stupid contrived setups. They're fun. I have a good time. <laughs> the ending of this book is a frustrating situation in the best dramatic way. It's like, it's the end of a season of a TV show and you're like, no, we cannot leave there. What are we doing? It's, oh, it is beautiful trash. It's amazing. Um, and actually, I wouldn't even say this is actually really bad. Like, Mortal Instruments, that first trilogy, it's it's not great. But this one, I actually really like the entire ensemble cast of characters. I The plot, like I said, was pretty engaging. There's this whole, 
it's not Jack the Ripper, but people keep dying mysteriously in the night, and we kind of have little glimpses into what's happening, but we don't know why. And normally her plots are not engaging to me, uh, but this one, I was just like, yeah, this is ominous. This is interesting, and it's affecting people that we know, and it's fun. And then this book in particular is a marriage of convenience book, which, yes, yes. <laughs> Oh, and there's all sorts of dramatic irony, too. Again, if any of these things are your anti-buzzwords, these are not subvertive. These are just these tropes, okay? But the dramatic irony of being like, ah, oh, but it's this thing. If he just didn't have this thing, it would be different. And ah, oh, it's just, yeah. But I like it. It knows the assignment. It's not going to be fun for everyone because it is contrived. It is convenient. That is the genre. At least that's what I think of it is in terms of like, I don't know if we have a subgenre for this, but this is like a fantasy soap opera. And I love it. Like, it, it truly is like that type of thing. And I have a fantastic time. The other Angels and Demons book is Even Though I Knew the End, which I didn't know would be Angels and Demons. Like, I guess I should have because it's deal with the devil. Like, I knew the main character made a deal with a demon or devil um, to do something. And then her time was running out. And so this story is the whole idea of you know, I know the day I will die. Would I do something differently, etc.? And it's a really fun story. I do think this story fit the novella framework perfectly. I still only gave it four stars. It was really fun, but it didn't quite make the five star experience for me, probably because I never got quite as connected as I wanted to. And I think that's because of a thing that I can't really mention that happens with one of the characters that made it like a larger cast of characters than I was expecting. I don't know how else to explain it without like spoiling a reveal that I thought was actually kind of cool, but I also think is why it's not a five-star book. But I did really enjoy reading the story. I really loved the Chicago setting. I, I think in this short amount of time, doing kind of a detective, noir, supernatural, paranormal thing was really fun for me. It didn't overstay its welcome. And I actually felt like the pacing of it was at a pretty good clip. I got reveals at really satisfying moments that made me want to keep reading. Um, it also could have been my reading mood that made it a little lower. I was definitely running out of steam and I was just like, I would really like to read this book. And I kept waiting to want to be in the mood. And I do think I finally got there, but it's kind of annoying that this book didn't get me in the mood. Like I've had books that even when I'm not in the mood, get me in the mood. And that this, that didn't happen with this one, unfortunately, but it was really cool. And you know, it also had Nephilim, which I wasn't like expecting. <laughs> and again, a, one of those historical books that definitely has representation we're not used to seeing and it was enjoyable. So really glad that my patrons made me read it and that I w watched all these reviews on it for my last recent release roundup and it put it on my radar. This last section are, these are, these are the books that were the highlights. The, I mean, I guess I could just call it highlights. Yeah, we'll just call it that. But I mean, at its core, what brings all of these together is that these are books that made me want to read. These are the books that got me back into physically reading with my eyeballs and not just relying on audiobooks. Relying is not the right word, but reading with my eyeballs takes more conscious focus effort than it does to listen to an audiobook and crochet, which is what I was doing for all the Wheel of Time books. And these three, they were fun. So the first one I'll talk about was my reread of Red Rising. I have a video on this where I talk about all the reasons why I shouldn't like this book, but that I do. So I'll be brief here, but on reread, it was a four and a half star. It was super fun. It knew the assignment. It was a melodramatic fun time. Why do I like this melodramatic character and not Hadrian from Empire of Silence? I don't know. Darrow's also not like a rich boy. Like Darrow is decidedly the opposite of a rich privileged individual. Like he's a red. That's the bottom. He's like even a low red. He's the bottom of the reds. Maybe that's part of it. That's what I think. There is also a live show with Leanna and Alex. We definitely go on tangents in that live show. And it's all spoiler filled. So like pretty soon we get into spoilers. Um, but that exists. So I'll have my review in the live show down below. But if you don't like it, I totally get it. I totally do. Um, this book made me want to read. And I'm really always extra appreciative of books that like suck me in and immerse me because it truly doesn't happen as often as I want it to. Um, especially like as a reader, I think that's like what we all want. We all have those memories of those moments that a book just like grabbed us and didn't let go. And I don't know if this book does that for me. This book is just like so easy for me to read and engage with, even with all of the faults that exist with it. Uh, the next one is Byrony and Roses by T. Kingfisher. This was so fun. I read this in like 24 hours, <laughs> I want to say. It was over the course of two days, but I think 
like in total it was like 24 hours of like having the book in my hand and this is a beauty and the beast retelling told by t king fisher and on one half it's exactly what you expect from a beauty and the beast retelling it hits the beats but on the other it's a t king fisher <laughs> so it's darker i it has a haunted house sort of element that and i like haunted houses so like there's also that um i really like the main character she's definitely one of those um middle-aged characters who actually is pretty grounded in who she is, which I really enjoy when T. Kingfisher brings those forward. Um, she likes to garden. The horse that we first meet has a lot of personality. And the mystery is really cool. This has like a mystery element that I wasn't expecting because again, in these ways, it's unique. But in others, it's just a Beauty and the Beast retelling. Like it was, it was really fun. And I loved the banter between the main characters. And like, I do kind of read T. Kingfisher for her character interactions and banter. They just work for me. I, I just, I'm in, I'm all in and it's so fun. So new favorite author, which I already kind of knew, but this just solidified it. And this is one of her earliest works. This is from, well, earliest works under this name, 2015. That's when this book came out. So that was a blast. And then the last one we'll talk about, I think looking through all of this was my favorite of the month, which it's not a fantasy. It's not a sci-fi. It is short stories-ish. And that's Girl, Woman, Other. This was fantastic. And I just keep thinking about it. And I just keep loving it. And, oh. And remember when I said earlier, if I'm not in the mood to read, sometimes it's really hard to focus on reading and I have to wait. I literally read this on a day I had an anxiety attack and it was able to help me. <laughs> not because the content's light or anything. It's just I was so focused on these women and their stories that I was able to like stop the spiral while reading this book. That's like the writing style was that good for me in my tastes. Um, if you don't like interconnected short stories, this probably won't work for you. I do think it's one of the top examples of this form. So if you won't ever wanted to explore it, try this one out. But if you already know yourself as a reader and you know that you need more time or prefer more time, I mean, you only get a chapter with each character. That's just kind of how it goes. But the vast amount of experiences you get to explore, the interconnectivity of it all, it, it, it felt so good. And then we had a book club discussion. So not only did I really like the book, then we had our book club discussion where we had like 17 people. And I think 14 of us gave it five stars and four people gave it four. Like we had a fantastic discussion going into every single story and discussing all the things we really appreciated and liked because these are very human characters and they're going through a lot of different trials that come with humanity. And some stories are going to be harder to read for some people than others. She doesn't like steer away from that. And then also you have a character that you've been with, you have sympathy for, you empathize with, and, and they're really flawed. And I, I just, it's my favorite type of literary contemporary fiction, like truly. I mean, I say contemporary, it's also kind of historical. Like we, we look through the entire 20th century up to today. Like it's really great, especially if you really don't know about the experience that black women go through in Britain. I know I don't. I learn a lot about the African-American experience, but a British black person experience, I know very little about. And you really get to see different ethnicities and their experiences in England and especially historically through the ages. It's just so good. I really like this book. I am even more angry about how it was treated in 2019 for its Booker Award, but it's fine. That's fine. We're just going to highlight how amazing this book is. It's so freaking good. And just so you guys know, since this is my Friday video, there will still be two videos next week. I'm pre-filming though, so it won't be a Friday Reads. So. Just, just as a heads up, it should still be a good video. I'm hoping if I get all the research done, it'll be my next recent release roundup for January. That is the tentative plan. If it's something else, just go with it. Just go with it. And if you want to leave an emoji, leave a wheel for the wheel of time, because honestly, gosh, I still can't believe I finished that. that that's been a journey. But otherwise, like if you liked it, subscribe if you want to, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.